Hi everybody, we are very fortunate to have uh, my friend uh, and uh, colleague Helen Greiner here. So uh, I think many of you are here because you're interested in drones. What's going on with drones? Uh, you know, who thinks that drones are real? Who thinks that they're science fiction? Okay, well we're getting pretty good there. So. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, Helen and I studied together uh, back at MIT way back when, and she's been, even before we met, pursuing her uh, love for robots and things like that. So we're going to hear a little bit about Helen and her background, about some of the new things that she's doing with drones today. And uh, we'll also have Ken Sebesta, uh, who is our, one of her uh, senior scientists, who is working on some of the technology <laughs> in place as well. So Helen, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So, uh, so first of all, why don't you uh, tell some people about kind of your background and your passion for robots and oh, um, my passion for robots goes back to when I saw Star Wars on the big screen when I was 11. Yeah, yes, I am that old. Uh, <laughs> and um, I fell in love with one of the characters, and it wasn't Luke Skywalker, it wasn't Han Solo, although he's darn cute. Um, <laughs> but it was R2D2 because R2D2. Uh, had an agenda, had a personality, saved the universe multiple times, and um, he was more than a machine. And I wanted to build things that are more than machines my whole life. So I went to MIT to learn how, and I learned a lot of wonderful things there. Played a lot of ice hockey with Susie. Um, <laughs> But they really didn't know how to build robots that you could get into people's hands. So I founded iRobot with two business partners right after uh, MIT. And um, uh, gosh, we, uh, we founded it in 1990. We put the Roomba on the market in 2002. Does anybody have a Roomba vacuum cleaner? Do people know it? Have you guys heard of the Roomba vacuum cleaner? Yep, that's iRobot. And um, we took it public in 2005. And um, so it was one of the longest overnight successes you'll ever see because people had never heard of us before we put the room on the market. We got wonderful robots out for the military in the caves in Afghanistan and uh, taking care of the IEDs in Iraq. They saved the lives of hundreds of soldiers and thousands of civilians. So I'm really proud of that. But after 18 years with iRobot in 2008, I looked at what was going on in the market and I said, I want to jump in and do drones because um, there's just so many things you can do with them, some of which we're talking about today. Excellent, excellent. So uh, that might not be no that known that much about iRobot, which is everyone's familiar with their vacuum cleaners, but they kind of had kind of two divisions. One is the consumer uh, part of the group, as well as the military and industrial side of it. And so, uh, so the, we're talking military grade, industrial grade robots, you know, that uh, have been developed. And I believe that for, uh, for sci-fi, you have something similar as well. So why don't you talk a little bit about sci-fi? Okay. Well, we've got some uh, industrial um, robots. We have them at a booth right over here, um, right to the, but to right our to left. the left over here, <laughs> to our left. And, um, uh, one of them's a tethered UAV. It goes up and it stays up and gives that persistent bird's eye view. Very rugged, industrially hardened, temperature spec, dust storms, sandstorms, rainstorms, snowstorms. And we're in Boston, so we know something about testing in snowstorms. Um, so that's a, a, a very industrial product. But there's also applications in light industrial, going out and just doing inspections, just going out in a very kind of easy weather, um, and getting that uh, remote perspective uh, on the situation. We're also building one that fits in your cargo pants pocket that is good if you want to go into an enclosed area because the first thing you lose is um, a wireless link and that's also a tethered drone. So it's running on a microfilament which is supplying power and communications for both that and the park robot. Excellent. And so, uh, so as, you're, uh, as you're actually working on these drones, can you talk about some of the applications that we're using these Oh, ends? sure, sure. We're and not. this is the thing of, is it science fiction or is it reality? It's reality. It's reality. Uh, first application is military. I have a strong background, as Susie mentioned, with military, delivering thousands of robots uh, for, the, uh, for, for the Army, Navy. And um, the first application for these tethered drones is to a combat outpost, doing tactical overwatch, looking for situational awareness. But we're taking that into public safety. We have a strategic agreement with Motorola. We are their drone provider. So these are tethered drones, so they can get a look at an entire situation as it unfolds and get the information back to their uh, common control point. 
We're working with oil and gas, we're working construction, we're working mining, we're working agriculture. There's just so many applications. And almost every physical industry right now is looking at their drone strategy. What, what are they going to do with drones? So, like, I used to have to kick down doors to get people interested in robots, and now everyone's calling on us. You know, can you get us a robot to do this, that, and the other um, industrial uh, jobs? So, it's a really great time. That's amazing. Uh, which of these application areas do you think are going to be coming? Or I guess you can tell us a little bit more about some of them. Well, we're doing the ones I mentioned uh, already. Um, increasing crop yields through uh, uh, real-time surveillance. Uh, we're connecting these persistent drones to tractor systems, to large um, industrial equipment, and providing that real-time video and surveillance. Um, we're doing so farming and agriculture. Farming and agriculture for safety, for um, infrastructure. Uh, our bridges are crazy aging and bad, and they send inspectors by roping them up, putting them on the, the arm of a snooper truck, and getting them into these really crazy locations. And it causes quite a lot of safety issues. Um, some die every year. And there's 600,000 bridges that need inspecting every two years in the United States, and most of them are in terrible shape. And we spend so much money on inspection that when we could get a, an eye view uh, from the drones, then uh, a really great application that's being done today is um, protecting endangered species. There are very few of these rhinos left in the world. If you get eyes on the uh, almost ex extinct animals real time, all the time, and keep people away from them, a wonderful, wonderful application for drone technology. Wow. Uh, keeping people connected with Motorola, we're putting a 4G network, we're flying it, and that gives you a uh, connection in places where um, you want your cell phone to work on a temporary basis like a large crowd or a disaster area and the, um, uh, the robots will be able to create that infrastructure instantaneously. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. So these are, oh, there's oh, more. Uh, securing homes and families, uh, having it uh, surveil your, your neighborhood. Um, and then I have to put up my hand and say, I am a believer in drone delivery. Uh, we are working on it. It won't be available for at least five years. And that's just to get into very realistic testing um, because there will be cultural, regulatory, and technical issues we have to overcome. But I do believe we're going to be getting our packages in half an hour. Instant gratification is what the customers want. And the drones, the shortest distance between any two points is as the drone flies. So you might as well use the drones to, uh, to, to deliver. And uh, for working on the regulatory issues with drones, I, I believe uh, the president has seen your drones? Uh, yes, yes. I took one of our drones to the White House the other day to meet with the president um, to encourage entrepreneurship worldwide, but also to talk about regulations. So, uh, so this is the kind of thing. What do you think about the regulations? So obviously when they, there's a new regulation that uh, created a set of rules around how drones may and may not be flown, uh, which kind of uh, holds back uh, right. drones uh, for delivery right now, but can you talk a little bit about those and let us know what so, you think about that? So um, the FAA just put us out a set of proposed rules that have to go through the rulemaking process, so they won't come into effect for um, at least a year and a half now because of the bureaucratic process. This is only for commercial drones. You have a hobby drone, you can go out and fly, and there's some guidelines that you need to fly under, like under 400 feet, not near airports, and within line of sight. Um, so hobbyists are flying all over the country, very good safety record, but commercially, they just proposed these rules. But before that, there was absolutely no way to fly commercially with a drone legally. A lot of people do it in the, on the gray market, but there's absolutely no way to fly. So the industry looks at it as a step forward. Even though it's not everything we would like, it's a place to start and we can build on it. And when we're able to prove we can do drone delivery safety, the FAA is open to examining the regulations and adding less constraints. So do you view this as a setback for the drone industry or a step no, forward? No, no, it's a step forward because before there was no way to fly unless you were a public entity like a police force or, and um, so none of the big companies could fly legally and, you know, they really watch what they do. 
Yeah. And so some smaller companies and some mom and pop shops would go fly and do real estate inspection, insurance compliance, uh, aerial photography and sell the pictures. All that was absolutely illegal. But now the FAA is giving you a way to get permission to, to fly. And they're going to open up so you don't have to get permission to fly in to early 2017. So it is yep. a step forward in a very slow bureaucratic way. <laughs> okay. And I guess it's also a thing you don't want a bad accident to occur to yeah. then really shut things down. So as the technology is improving, this can, this can help. Right, but since hobbyists can fly, as long as you're not making money flying, and they've had a really good safety record, I'm pretty hopeful that um, this is going to be fine for industry too. Great, great. Uh, so um, I hear you're entering the consumer market. We are. Can you tell us a little bit about that? We are. Um, we, uh, uh, we invented, well I should say, Ken, who you'll meet in a moment, invented a wonderful technology when he was working on the industrial drones called Level Up. And it allows uh, these drones to fly levelly. So they fly like no drone you've ever seen because all the drones tilt into the motion. And that puts all that tilting motion onto the video image. So companies go to great length and expense to put a pan tilt gimbal on the vehicle to compensate for that. We've been able to get rid of that, move the camera into the drone, which makes it a very stable platform, makes it so we can do a swipe to fly, control it from your cell phone. Um, and then we have some safety features like geofencing. So the first time you fly, you can um, uh, not worry about going into a tree or your neighbor's uh, yard. And we do real-time sharing because drone flying is fun and social. And just like you share a video clip or a stunning picture from your camera in real time, that's what you're able to do with our drones as well. While you're still in flight, you don't have to land to do it. <laughs> So we're kickstarting these right now. We have nine more days left in a very successful campaign. Well, we're up to 580K, where 250K was our goal, our original goal. And um, uh, we'd love you all to check it out, tweet about it, um, share it on Facebook, tell all your friends, because we want to get as many as these really cool drones out there as we can. So uh, are folks familiar with Kickstarter? So basically, uh, you know, for entrepreneurs who are trying to start and go into new areas, it's a way to actually get donations to, uh, you know, purchase these uh, products that are going to be made and then use it to fund the creation of them. So uh, that's the campaign that Helen was talking about. And the drones will come out about when? Um, if they purchase we, one we're now. We're starting it now, and they'll come out February. So we have to integrate a camera module. We have to get it into production in the Far East, which takes some time. But our demonstration, um, would you like a demo? Uh, would you give us a demo? Do yeah, you guys let's want a demo? a demo. All right. There we go. This is the level one, and you can see it's perfectly level in flight. And it's easy to, uh, how Julio <laughs> wow. Iglesias did this the other night, sliced his fingers, but I'm much smarter than that. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> And uh, I didn't look scared, did I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so, come up. so uh, this is fantastic. So, so here you see the uh, the first prototypes of the level one drone, the consumer drone. This is what you can purchase with the Kickstarter campaign. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's talk to the chief scientist behind this uh, product. He's Ken? tweeting something, I think. Okay, Ken is tweeting. Hey, Ken, stop tweeting. Come up here. <laughs> okay, so Ken. Ken, first of all, great job on your uh, on your technology so you can talk here. With Susie. So let me just I actually was filming everybody. I hope that's okay to uh, to put out. If anybody doesn't like that, just let me know and I'll I'll blur your face out. Are you guys okay that it was filmed? Yeah. Awesome. So, sorry. Cut your finger and then record it. Uh, uh, I'm not actually not sure I could. That. That's that's the advantage <laughs> of small blades. Small blades are safe blades. So, uh, so Ken, why don't you tell us about some of the technology <laughs> behind the Level One drone? Well, so clearly there's. Uh, let me just turn this around. So we have uh, the very first thing that you noticed. Helen told you about. This flies flat, and you can see from the morphology. This is a little differently shaped from most multi-rotors that you've seen. You've seen these drones and their quadcopters, and their blades are all flat. 
So two things. First off, this is a hexacopter, so we have six rotors. And second off, you can notice that the rotors look a little rakish. It looks a little uh, advanced, a little, little bit like a, a swooping shape, and I like that. Rakish, I like that. Rakish. <laughs> yeah. So what this allows us to do is by integrating the swoop into the vehicle, we take the swoop out of the camera. So as Helen said, a normal quadcopter is going to fly around like this. So if I'd come up on the stage and I'd taken a picture of you guys, I would have had you a bit of an angle until I leveled out. Then as I was stopping, I would have had you at a different angle, and then finally hovering still, I would have had the shot I wanted. Now, I can fix that with mechanics. So I can hang a heavy gimbal off the bottom, and the gimbal will go right as the drone goes left, so the camera's always level. But the problem with gimbals, they're expensive. That would have doubled our price. If you want to know why our closest competitor is $1,000 and we're $500, it's because the gimbal is a $500 component. The gimbal's heavy. Heaviness costs flight time. It's complex. And we all know that complex parts like to fail. So by moving that, just by that one innovation, we get to cut the cost in half. So that's a wonderful example uh, of using mathematics and using mechanics to solve a complex parts problem. So another thing that, that lets us do, as Helen mentioned, is it changes the way that you interface with your drone. You're used to seeing people fly with these remote controls. And that's a great way of doing it, and I like to do it. But I'm a pilot. I fly real airplanes, and I fly these drones. But I don't think you should have to do that. That's not my vision. My vision is you should be able to fly one of these the way that you're used to doing anything. That is to say, intuitively. And the most intuitive interface that anybody's come up with so far is, let's be honest, it's the iPhone. Now, I'm an Android user, but it's still the iPhone has got the locks on that. So we've looked at the way iPhone does things, and we've looked at the camera, in particular an iPhone, because that's what we want to channel. That's our vision. This is not a drone. This is a flying camera. This is a camera that you can use. I like to say a go-go gadget arm. And I'm looking around the audience, and I think everyone here is at least old enough to remember Inspector Gadget. So you have a go-go gadget arm, and it puts your arm somewhere where you can't otherwise reach it. And so there's where you want to take the picture. That's the angle you want. So this. Uh, this swipe to fly lets you inf interface with the drone the way you interface with a camera. Helen also mentioned a couple of the other features, uh, which I won't go into right now, but we'd love to tell you about at our booth. But it's a really neat, uh, exciting venture to go down. I joined Sci-Fi Works recently, uh, just over a year ago, and to already be involved in, in her vision, as she laid out, of where these can go, and then to be able to apply my own vision of the software and the API and the way that you users should be able to relate to our product and extend it. Because we built something that might be good for 99% of you guys, but the 1% of you have some really neat questions that I want to answer. And I'm not going to be able to build the answer for you. I need to give you the tools so you can build the answer for yourself. So, uh, so uh, Ken and Helen, we're here in the DevNet zone, so, and uh, we're here in the scope of Internet of Things. So can you just tell us a little bit about the relationship and uh, how, how this relates to the Internet of Things, how uh, Sci-Fi is working with Cisco and DevNet? Oh, um, well, from a macro perspective, um, Cisco is doing not just the Internet of Things, but the Internet of Everything. And now the Internet of Everything includes drones and robots. So um, we have an open API, and we're connecting it to Dev IoT, um, which is um, you know how we would envision using a device like this in a factory as we become more and more autonomous. Um, or uh, in, a, in a warehouse looking for uh, inventories, um, you know, one of the large big box stores looking for inventories, or uh, going around a smokestack and, uh, you know, examining it so you don't have to close it down. There's so many applications, but um, they require people to be able to easily use and track where the robots are, and that's the kind of applications that um, DevNet is working on. And uh, DevIoT, it's called Project Hello World as well, is right over there in the middle, and you can see it's a way to actually program IoT apps as well as lay them out on a physical environment so that you can then actually program your environment, fly drones, add robots to them as well. Do you want to say can, something about the yeah, underlying can, can code? can you talk some more about that? So, Susie showed me uh, what she was just talking about and the way that it's designed to work with the train. And the very first thing I, I did was I turned to her and I said, how can I get this on my drone? This is incredible. This is exactly the interface that I want. Because on the back end, I need to give you the tools that you want to express what the robot can do. 
But on the front end, you need the ability, you need the, the graphical user interface so that you don't have to learn my own particular brand of embedded C in order to get the robot to do your vision. And so if that's a vision of, of flying a robot until you sense uh, maybe in a certain atmospheric condition or until your battery gets too low or until you spend a certain amount of time hovering over a place or until you take 10 photos and then move on to the next part of your mission. This is, this is the enabling technology, the ability for you to give a high level command. Like if I were to tell a child to go to the store and get me a can of Coke, I don't have to tell the child how to move the child's legs or how to walk or which way to walk, or what kind of Coke I want, or what size Coke to buy. This is all kind of implicit in the instruction stack. Now, the drones aren't that smart. We still have to give them a little bit more information. But I want a tool like that so that you can define these high-level ideas in a simple flowchart and accomplish your mission without having to understand how to become a pilot. Can, uh, also, I believe you use some different open source software technologies inside here. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that since we have a DevNet audience? Sure. So I am the co-founder of an open source autopilot association. It's called Tau Labs. Tau is in the Greek letter. We've had software out for about five years, uh, open source software, several thousand users, and it makes it, it's nice. It makes it bulletproof to have so many people out there trying your ideas. This is a critical part. You have to give people the ability to look at what you're doing so that they can make slight modifications to make uh, the product perfect for themselves. Because even if we get this high level working, maybe you're a researcher like myself. Maybe you like the idea, but you want to try some new math. And you really should be able to get into the control code itself, to get into the architecture, to get into the state machines, and make tiny modifications or even large ones that fundamentally change the way these things work. So that software, the Tau Labs firmware, is actually integrated into here. We're really excited about this drone because I'm not sure how many of you guys can see this, but we've given you access to the power and the data. So if you want to interface with our Linux computer, if you want to use power from our battery to run your own task, so this vehicle's flying and it gives you everything you want. It gives you what you need, a drone that you can fly without having to think about it. It's just missing some of the sensors or some of the capabilities. You can interface directly and you can use the open source flight code to give you exactly the behavior you want for the mission that you have. Excellent. So we only have about uh, four minutes left. Do we have, can take one or two questions from the audience. Do we have any questions out here? Yep, right there. Yeah, oh, use the, please use the microphone. Hi, so, hello, thank you. Uh, wonderful job, thank you. Um, question for you is, what's the battery life uh, on these drones? Because right now, the, from a consumer perspective, the limitation is the battery. Yeah, and, and uh, there's nothing on the horizon that's going to fix the battery problem, right? Both for cell phones, and electric, or cell phones, electric cars, and drones, we'd love to see batteries get an order of magnitude better. But we think that there is plenty of battery life in this to accomplish missions. We have a, we're specking a 20 minute flight time, but we've seen up to 37 minutes in the laboratory. We think that 20, we think that a mission is 15 minutes of flight plus five minutes of setup. So that really hits the sweet spot. Another question? Yeah, um, I'm just curious, do you see this technology actually migrating to personal transportation? <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I think it's good that we're testing it on the small scale before we go to the um, personal uh, uh, device. But I, I, I would imagine within 20 years um, we could we could do that. But it is quite a, quite 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 far out um, to, to get all the technologies um, working and to make it safe enough to put a human on board. <laughs> uh, what's the um, reasonable payload that it could carry if you add your own uh, accessories to it, or? Uh Features. So we actually plan on that. Uh, one of the advantages of the feet that pop off is we publish the schematic for feet that you can print out on a 3D printer or you can modify beforehand. So we expect this uh, that most users won't want to carry more than 400 grams, so about a pound. So we're expecting 10 minutes of flight time at one pound. You could actually carry almost two pounds, but that would compromise your battery life below a useful mission. Yeah, one question about uh, the discussion about the integration of drones inside the uh, flight control system just to make them safer. Any, any comments on this? 
the integration, integration with the, the um, aircraft control system. Oh yeah, yeah. We um, <clears throat> because we want to do delivery drones. You won't need that for these small hobby drones. You fly below 400 feet, and you visually see if there's anything coming. Um, for the larger drones to do package delivery, uh, we have uh, a lot of expertise in a system called ADSB, uh, which gives you location and um, transmits your location to the FAA. The FAA is going to require that on every manned plane, even the small ones, by 2020. So the drones will be using that, and then they'll auxiliary have a sense and avoid local, um, uh, well, lo local sense and avoid system on board for redundancy. We're just going to stay well away from everyone. It's a big open space. Great. Big open space just waiting for the drones to deliver packages. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, I like to fly FPV, and I'm sure you probably do as well. Um, do you uh, see this platform as being FPV capable? So I like to fly FPV when I'm actually sitting inside the cockpit. Uh, <laughs> my reflexes aren't the best in the world. One of the things that we know from iRobot is that uh, you need a sub-100 millisecond um, window in order for the user to feel connected to the machine. And FPV really pushes that to sub 10 millisecond. That's difficult to achieve with anything other than analog data. Uh, this is a consumer drone, so we think the, the big market is to be able to set up the perfect shot on your uh, phone. And while I'm very excited about a side project bringing this to Google Cardboard, I don't expect that you will have a very satisfactory FPV racing experience just because that's the most blindingly fast thing I've ever seen done. But I can imagine uh, another kind of a contest that has everyone using the same drone for agility as well as speed, getting through things, and also creativity. What kind of, um, and I, I might even be working on such a thing. <laughs> Good heads up. Um, uh, so, okay, so we're pretty much at the end. Do you guys have any final words? I do. I yes? do. Yes. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone um, if they've wanted a drone for a while to support our Kickstarter campaign. We're only on for the next nine days. Very successful. It's the only way to get this revolutionary drone, but you have to do it in the next nine days. How and much is the drone? It's four ninety five on Kickstarter. It's going to retail for over $600. Okay. Any other final words, Ken? I'd just like to say to buy a second drone after you buy the first one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, as we're, uh, you know, talking about the Internet of Things, then it's, uh, it's very realistic to think about how drones can play into this scenario. So as we're uh, looking at things like emergency response, the sensors tell you something's wrong in a certain area, go out and get more sensing done in that area, for instance. So, you know, continuing to think about the possibilities in here is very interesting and we're at this place where uh, the technology is going to match the application need probably at a very interesting time. So, uh, so thank you every month, everybody for coming and uh, thanks to uh, Helen and Ken for all their great work. And we're, we're going to stick around and answer any questions too. Yep, great. great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Susie, Helen.